Wonderful. I am um, so looking forward to this conversation today. Um, I'm the Chief Executive for Center for Transforming Lives. I've been with the organization now for 15 years. And what draws me to the work is having a, a background that is similar to many of the folks that, um, that go through our programming, um, uh, growing up in a family with a lot of financial challenges and trauma, um, and, and just being able to um, build programming that is truly effective and engages um, families, um, uh, the children and the, the mothers in um, creating sustainable paths for their futures toward financial and emotional well-being. Thank you so much, Summer, over to you. Yes. Hey, y'all. I am Dr. Summer Rose. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer for Communities and Schools of the Dallas region. Um, fancy title just means that I get to support mental health services on K through 12 campuses across the DFW Metroplex. And so uh, a bit about what draws me to the work. I have a family value I was raised on. We are blessed to be a blessing and also to leave a place better than the way that you found it. And so uh, my purpose and passion in this in this world has been to do that through providing mental health services to folks across the lifespan. So glad to be here and engaging in this conversation. Having worked for, with you and been friends with you for quite some time, I can say you live that every day. I see Thank that. Thank you. Um, and Matthew, if you could introduce yourself. Of course. My name is Matthew Eubanks, and I have been a licensed professional counselor for about 20 years and am coming up on my two-year anniversary uh, as the director for clinical counseling services here at CTL. And I would love to share what draws me um, into the work, not on a large scale, but specifically our work here at CTL. Um, in my years as a counselor, I feel like uh, the counseling and therapy community has done a great job helping people face trauma, um, has done a great job helping folks heal from anxiety and depression. Uh, what we've struggled with, at least in my experience, has been the kind of two-generational wraparound support um, that we see happen every day here at Center for Transforming Lives. Um, because of the great team here, we're able to really surround our participants um, not just with trauma support and counseling and psychotherapy, but also with housing support and um, financial um, wellness support and such high quality early childhood education that then makes my work as a counselor and the work that I support with my wonderful team so much easier because people's uh, systemic needs are being met. And that has just been a really exciting thing for me. And um, and that's my why. Congratulations on almost two years. And yes. I love that you shared about the ancillary support. I know oftentimes I'm in the community and hear what's the one thing. Human beings are complex. Family systems are complex. And there is no one thing. Um, but uh, having wraparound comprehensive support we know can be effective. So um, Carol, we'll start with you. Um, I will say on behalf of CTL, just anecdotally looking at our data, we have seen um, an increase in the number of um, participant cases that involve intimate partner violence um, and um, violence for children and families. And so um, I was wondering, you know, with your extensive background, if you could share um, the connection between early exposure to violence and subsequent or later in life homelessness um, and experiences of poverty and trauma. Certainly. Um, I, so just um, a little bit more about the, um, the model that we've developed here at Center for Transforming Lives. It is two generational, so we're always keeping um, in mind both the child and the parent, primarily mothers in, in our situation. And so one of the areas of the work that we most focus on is those early years and um, early childhood brain development. Um, so we our work is really informed by 
um, neuroscience's ever increasing understanding of that first 1,000 days, um, you know, just to give you mm. kind of a sense, um, more than 1 million new neural connections are formed every second during that period. Um, and so the interaction between um, the um, child and the adults or their environment really forms the architecture of a child's brain. Um, so kids that, um, little ones that experience lots of safety and security have lots of connections and for the different parts of their brain. Um, their amygdala, you know, that, that part that, um, that kind of, um, basic part of the brain that operates um, for survival, um, fight or flight, um, kind of normally develops, so, and so does that prefrontal cortex, um, that executive decision-making part of the brain. Um, so what we're really focused on is that kind of physical structural reality and the impact that pover poverty and trauma has on that um, that first 1,000 days. So, um, so what do we see? We see insufficient physical or verbal interaction or traumatic experiences. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that in those early years. Um, but you know, things like witnessing violence or being evicted, um, that those result in permanent changes to the architecture of the brain. Um, so research shows that. Um, even though those results may be mitigated in their older years, um, it takes a whole lot more effort for that mitigation and the physical impacts of early trauma and the deprivation are lifelong. Um, so, so then looking a little bit more at adverse childhood experiences, um, you know, and we kind of blanketly refer to those as trauma, but there are, it, those are abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction. Um, so, um, children and adults, but um, children who are experiencing poverty and homelessness are at lots higher risk for those adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Um, and the greater number of the ACEs means more long-term health challenges, um, more interference with academic success, um, and greater adult instabilities. So one of the things you know, that we are seeing um, in this post-COVID time of um, high eviction rates, high housing costs, um, very much increased um, instabilities in people's daily lives, um, more mental health challenges, we are seeing a corresponding increase in our population of intimate partner violence. So um, we are seeing that just in the, the stressors in the families, but we but we are also seeing, um, you know, with that um, eviction rates are pretty typically around um, one in 10 renting households in Tarrant County are being evicted each month. So that means that oftentimes mothers, particularly those with young children, are um, entering into relationships for the purpose of housing stability. And sometimes those relationships are not safe for children. Um, and so this is, it's all interrelated in our, um, so our, our work, whether that's in the early childhood classroom or that's in the clinical counseling or that's in housing, I mean, any of those areas, we're all finding ourselves challenged to respond to, um, all of those realities um, and the kind of the corresponding behaviors that we're seeing um, in all of those different environments and um, finding the best way to, to intervene, um, to provide treatment and to provide a comprehensive response. So. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, I should have said this at the beginning of the webinar, but I'll offer it now. I always try to do this when we're talking about trauma is um, Center for Transforming Lives really aims to serve as a beacon of hope. So does communities and school. Um, and so um, when we're talking about an increasing number of things like adverse childhood experiences and long-term outcomes, um, we want to point out that with intervention, those um, experiences can be mitigated, and that's what we serve to do in the community, and also tremendous resilience can be developed, and so just want to make sure 
and highlight both. Um, so Dr. Rose, um, coming over to you, you shared just a little bit about communities and school um, in your um, introduction, but if you could share um, anything more, more about the type of programming that is offered. Um, and then we'd love to hear, you know, also for you anecdotally, um, what are you concerned about when it comes to child and adolescent mental health and well-being? Um, and what are you optimistic about? So allow me to share a little bit about Communities in Schools. So Communities in School is a national nonprofit and the Dallas affiliate is one of the largest in the country. And so next year we will be celebrating our 40th birthday, which is really exciting for us. You know, we're trying to catch up with you all in your hundred plus year uh, um, of serving folks, but we are nearly 40 uh, in the work that we've been doing to support public school students in grades, pre-K through 12. And so what we do is we provide case management and mental health services to over 10,000 students annually. And then we also support school-based activities for over 100,000 students uh, annually. So this past year, we were in over 100 schools and uh, spread out across 14 area ISDs. So we are as far north as Sherman, Bonham, and Denison, as far south as Midlothian and DeSoto. And what that looks like is we have a dedicated staff person on campus providing services, case management services daily to students every day that the school is open at no cost to those families. Um, additionally, for those students who are receiving our case management services that are generally geared towards supporting academics, behavior, and attendance, uh, and, and also basic needs, we have the team that I feel very fortunate to lead, which is the clinical team. And so of those students that we are case managing, as we are noticing mental health challenges, they get referred over to my team and we're able to provide individual group or crisis counseling, kind of depending on the need. So you know, you asked about what are my, my greatest concerns, and I will say, you know, it is disturbing the amount of depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, and completed suicide that we are seeing amongst our students and some of the youngest of our students. So, um, you know, one, one that comes to mind is, you know, right as we were wrapping the end of the school year last year, was uh, a, a sixth grader who died by suicide, um, took his life, left a note for his family and put a message out on TikTok to the folks who um, had been bullying him over the past year. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the reason why that is so disturbing on so many levels is I don't know where you all were in sixth grade, but suicide was not even something that I even had a, a, a mechanism to understand. That was nowhere you know, in my in my frontal lobe, in my executive functioning, thinking through, you know, the consequences of taking my own life. And so, you know, as we are embracing the fact that we are in a digital age and, you know, things have shifted and none of us have been youth, right, in 2024, uh, really trying to understand how we are leveraging the 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 positive things that that technology offers while also kind of putting in some safeguards for our students, because once upon a time, you know, parents were really the folks that they got to decide when and where you got access to certain information. Well, there's something called the World Wide Web that has taken that over for us. And so, you know, with this, this, this earlier access um, and just, you know, having everything available at your fingertips, you know, families have to be, or I would, I would, I encourage families to be, you know, a little bit more vigilant about uh, what what their students are are consuming, how they're taking that information in, and then how they're understanding that in their developing brains, which Carol spoke to, right? Um, so th those are kind of my concerns. And then you ask kind of like this optimistic view. And uh, my hope, where I find hope in, is in partnering with organizations that also think similarly to you all, to our organization about the the wraparound systemic need to support youth and families in order to make a difference, right? You can kind of get bogged down in your corner of the world and like, oh my goodness, you know, we're seeing so much, 
But when I can kind of come up and I can see the connections that we have specifically in Dallas, right, and, and across the DFW region with other nonprofits and other organizations that really do center mental health and wellness for, for individuals, specifically youth and families, uh, that brings me hope, right, that I'm not in this alone. You probably heard me say, I think I've said this on past webinars, if we want to show up in this world to heal the community, we can only do it together. So just join you in that. I did have one um, thought and follow up um, question because I know we have practitioners and managers on the call. So Matthew is across the hall from me. I'm very fortunate to be on the floor with clinicians and case managers. Um, I'm often offering hugs or <laughs> just... Um, you know, prayers, poems, quotes, um, just out of compassion for how difficult it can be to walk through, for example, um, what you described with the sixth grader. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering for clinicians or managers that are on the call, um, how you are thinking about caring for your clinicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I feel a great sense of, of pride and privilege to sit in the seat that I that I sit in. Um, where I, you know, everybody is always like, when I get to my seat at the table, I'm going to do it this way, right? We've all had managers that we've learned from, um, both good and bad. And I think, you know, one of the greatest compliments that my team has paid me is saying that I have created a soft place to land for recovering workaholics who experience workplace trauma, right? So the vicarious trauma that comes um, from the work that we do uh, we have to be mindful of how we're hearing for ourselves. And I think that that's, you know, top down and, you know, left to right what that looks like. So really acknowledging the humanity of the people that I support um, that are, you know, boots on the ground that are doing that work. Uh, they are humans first before they are, you know, employees or team members here at CIS. Uh, and so that, you know, looks mental health days, um, you know, thinking about equity because not everybody needs everything and you know certain people need different things to, to thrive and so really leaning into that uh, and you also caught us on the week of our retreat so on Thursday and Friday we will be doing our clinical team retreat where part of that is kind of a data dump but the other part of it is rest and re um, restoration right really encouraging them to celebrate the bodies and the minds that carried them through the school year I'm um, giving them an opportunity to you know express gratitude and also embrace uh, rest, right? Because we we do we do a lot of hard work over here. Uh, so our, that's kind of the theme. We have different practitioners, healing practitioners that will come and be a part of our um, our retreat, so that we're able to really set ourselves up. Because we do take a, a bit of a break, a couple of weeks off in the summertime before we gear up going into the new school year. Um, so I think it's policies and 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 procedures, but I also think it's compassion in the way that you interact daily and really centering. Who, who you your your reportees are as individuals and what they need to be best successful. And once they tell you, then you got to do something with that, right? You can't just sit on that. Um, it's okay, well, that maybe we need to look at what, what accommodations can be put in place to make sure that your needs are being served as well as that of the organization, which, you know, is mission driven. We want to support kids and families. And so, um, I'm willing to consider whatever needs to happen so that they're able to do that in the best way. Love that. Thank you. It it makes me think of like the universal lesson of I offer grace and compassion to myself. I offer grace and compassion to others mm -hmm. and that they're on the same continuum. Mm -hmm. Matthew, um, over to you. And so Matthew, <laughs> you are working with a team, you know, very similar to Dr. Rose, um, every day working with children and families and really focusing on um, taking a family systems approach. I'm wondering if you could talk to us about why that family systems approach is important um, and how you were doing that here with your team at CTL. Absolutely. So we, the, I love the question because we know that it is important, right? We just want to know why. And as I think about how we see that play out with my team, first, I just want to pay homage to um, my colleagues who are marriage and family therapists and who are social workers uh, by training because they have helped counselors like me think in a more systems way 
Um, and that's so vital, not just with the work that we do here at CTL, but but in our field as a whole. So why do we think that the family systems work is so important? I'll give you several reasons that we're seeing. Um, one, it helps to dispel the myth that family members are each an island unto themselves. We know that that's just not the case. Um, a family is a complex organism with uh, interactions and patterns. And, and because of that, issues um, that any one family member might be experiencing aren't just isolated to that um, to that member. The old idea of the identified client or the identified patient kind of kind of goes away when we look at treating the, the entire family. Um, and that's not to place blame or to um, abdicate responsibility for any one person, but it's the understanding that, let's take children, for example, their behavior, well, not just children, all of us, behavior is communication. Behaviors that we see in an early childhood playground or a high school classroom or a boardroom, for that matter, it, it's meant to communicate. So when we yeah, take the, the lens and look at the wider family unit, um, we see things like marital conflict or parenting styles or family stressors um, that help us really understand and appreciate the interconnected dynamics. Another reason it helps us uh, see the person more holistically. Um, it, again, people are influenced by factors like family roles and family rules and communication patterns. Um, maybe this teenage rebellion that we're seeing might be a response to overly strict parenting, or it might be a response to um, parenting that isn't exerting enough of an authority. We wouldn't know unless we look at the wider family, um, and that becomes then the way that we treat. Another reason uh, the changes that we uh, affect in uh, individual therapy and in family therapy are so much more sustainable when we look at the family unit. Um, that was the, the first thing I noticed working with CTL and embracing this two generational approach. Year after year, I would see uh, kids making such great gains in the school environment see them in August and some of those games washed away. Um, and there are a lot of things that we did to um, mitigate that, bringing parents in and that sort of thing. But the change is sustainable when we involve the whole family. Um, another thought, family work helps break negative cycles. I think it's so interesting. Different faith communities, talk about uh, how things proceed through generations, different psychological theories. Jung talks about the collective unconscious. You know, every, every theoretical set um, talks about it in different ways, but we know that trauma impacts generations. I'm not um, a biological scientist, but I'm I guarantee you, and I know that we store it in our cells, not just in our hearts. Uh, it's it's in the body. Um, and this family work helps break those cycles, whether we're teaching new skills uh, about communication or we're uh, helping uh, families heal from patterns of abuse and neglect. When we interrupt those cycles, um, those negative effects are not passed down in the same way and the positive effects are highlighted. Jess, you mentioned resilience um, a few minutes ago. One of the most incredible things that I've seen since I've been here, we've started um, administering a resiliency tool, uh, an assessment to our participants. And I must have, uh, it, in order to roll it out to the team, I took the assessment myself to show here's the process, here's what we do. I called it, you know, test, but it was really me. I must have not slept well the night before, or maybe I had a deadline and I, somebody had, I don't know. But my resiliency score that day wasn't incredibly high. But when I log into the spreadsheet to see the scores that our participants have, they're all so much higher than mine that day. And so we do want to highlight um, that we're not just uh, stopping the negative, but we're highlighting the positive and we're um, allowing that to be uh, passed down. A couple more things we see when we do family work, and these are real obvious, but 
we see improved family, uh, I'm sorry, improved parenting skills. Um, sometimes our parenting adults, I'm convinced that almost all the time our parenting adults are doing the very best that they can with what they have. Sometimes the information they've gotten may not be quite up to the minute, um, especially when we see uh, grandparents who are raising grandkids. They're doing a wonderful job. And when they are provided uh, new information based on neuroscience, they're ready to implement it. And they're so excited. And we hear things like, oh, gosh, I wish I had known this 40 years ago and I could have implemented it with my children. Um, so we see uh, we see uh, improved parenting skills. And that's so encouraging. The last thing, um, and this is uh, a tip of the hat to my social worker friends. When we do systems work, we don't just affect one person. The family therapists say, if you change one person in the system, you change the whole system. And then if we expand that view, if we change the family system, then we're addressing systemic issues that extend from the single family dwelling to the block and the neighborhood and the zip code and the city and the state and the nation. And that is, that's our goal. Um, then we start seeing issues like financial stress and cultural inequity um, and these external influences change because we've expanded our view from just the single person to the family unit. Um, and so that's that's the how, I or some of the hows and the whys for why that family work is so important. And um, we're looking for new ways to, to do that every day. Thank you so much. I love that you brought up that strengths-based approach and why that's so important. And I know just because um, <laughs> we're friends and have these conversations that, you know, I, I too believe that trauma stores in every cell. I also believe every cell and every human being is hardwired to recover mm -hmm. and hardwired to heal. Um, and as you were talking about working with the family system and the community system, et cetera, I was thinking of each system as already having what it takes to heal and sort of we're just walking alongside and supporting. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Um, Carol, we um, are moving into our new campus. It's it's happening quick um, in the fall of 2024. And so this provides opportunities for um, expansion of services, but also it provides opportunity for increased social connections. And so I was wondering if you could talk about why both are important. Absolutely. I am uh, just as a brief recap of our um, our new campus and um, and how um, it will be different. So we're moving into um, 76119. Um, it's an area where there is both um, high need um, and also lots of opportunity, um, lots of good momentum already happening in that area. Um, and um, and we just are moving in to be even more of a catalyst for growth um, to really develop strength from within. So um, so the model that we've designed, the, the physical space, the programming is really um, just to support those, um, that kind of strength that um, that's kind of been inter interwoven in this conversation that building on um, resiliency. So, um, so, one of the ways that that will really show up is in uh, the partnership opportunities. So we've created specific um, uh, rooms and space that will um, allow for partners to come in to provide whether that's healthcare services or um, economic mobility services or um, connections to social services, um, uh, we the that space is designed to foster partnerships um, and partnerships specifically for um, 
not exclusively, but specifically with single mothers um, and their children in mind, um, because one of the differentiators in that in that campus is free drop in childcare. Um, so people who um, you know say I'm a healthcare provider, I'm a social service provider, and part of my population that I really have challenges connecting to are those single mothers with children because. I don't provide child care. I don't provide um, uh, waiting rooms that are really uh, suitable for children. So those partners will be able to um, do that in that physical space. Um, so we're really um, just wanting to make it much easier for families to um, seek out and receive the services that they want. Um, so on their journey toward economic and emotional well-being. Um, so very excited about those partnerships. Um, also, um, that that social connection that that this space will foster between people who engage in our services. Um, one of the members of our parent advisory council um, said to me, "Just it was just it was so striking." She said, "You know, she said, where you grow is what you know," <laughs> and um, and in in her case. Um, she was talking about growing up in a family system where there was a lot of violence, there was a lot of drugs. And so she was expressing how hungry she is and has been in her life for healthy social connection. Um, and I can tell you that those mothers that were sitting in that room as part of the parent advisory council, I think they got um, so much more out of that session um, than even we did. I mean, we were asking their advice and their experiences, but they were just connecting about all the things, parenting and housing and resources and the feelings of isolation. And, um, and so we know that, you know, social, social connection is important to all of us, um, but I think it's in particular um, important that we think about um, single mothers and um, their experience of isolation. Um, and they they can be, for many different reasons, so much more prone to, um, to the experience of isolation, isolation in their parenting, isolation from um, maybe extended family support systems um, or from a former partner or from that feeling of being judged. I mean, there's just, there's so many different layers of isolation. And so we really find that those, that the women, um, are hungry for connections with each other um, and really eager to problem solve and be a part of lifting each other up more than anything. You know, I have loved to see that when we've done focus groups and other gatherings to see that they, the immediate desire for connection and to support one another. Um, and I just wanna say, it's been such an honor to, to watch you as um, a professional here, but also as a trauma survivor and how intentional you've been as the leader in creating a space that will be a safe haven. So um, I know we're also excited. Um, okay, Dr. Rose and, and everyone, if you have any questions, please drop them in the QA and chat function. I am checking, there are none yet. Um, so uh, Dr. Rose, we're now in summer and um, you know, I know my children are thrilled not to be in school, but there are um, increased risks that can be present over the summer. And so wondering for um, whether it be professionals or parents that are listening either now or once we put this reporting onto YouTube, what you would recommend um, to both in order to keep their um, children and adolescents that they love safe. So great question and very timely. Uh, while a lot of Youth and parents, parents of school-age children, we're all very excited to not have to set alarms and stay on folks about homework and deadlines and all the things that we had to do to drag our children <laughs> through the end of the school year and hopefully ending on a successful uh, note. But you know, for some for some families, that 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 loss of uh, structure and purpose that the school year provides um, can can be a little you know daunting. It can, you know, bring up some you know, things for folks, anxiety, uh, loneliness, some depressive symptoms. 
uh, or it can exa exacerbate those things, right? Because that now structure, that that consistency, uh, I got to be here at this time. This is my day. I know what to expect. It's now gone, right? So structure the structure of the summertime and the purpose of you know, I am a student, I go to school, I'm supposed to do homework assignments, all of that is kind of lost. And so uh, while, you know, we appreciate being able to sleep in, you know, we don't want that to go into, we never get out of the bed, right? So we know that some of our adolescents, if they could, would spend all of their time in the bed on TikTok or on a video game, neglecting personal hygiene and things of such, right? Um, you know, the other thing that can be lost from you know, not having the stability of the school day is that kind of social fabric, right? There is some natural interactions that that take place just because we have to go into a building with you know 300 plus other people. Um, and the other thing that we kind of lose or have a little bit less uh, of during the summertime is is supervision, right? So we don't have the teachers, the coaches, the the music folks, the the art teachers that are putting an eye on our, our kids pretty consistently. And so with all of those things kind of swirling around, it really does kind of create a perfect storm for some of some of our youth. Um, and, and research shows that in the months of June and July, we see an uptick in risky behavior. So, you know, start to think experimenting with drugs, um, doing some drinking, doing some drinking and driving, some, you know, risky sexual activity. Um, and so want parents to know that these things are real and to lean into how how maybe we start to think about combating this. Now, all the youth of the world are going to throw tomatoes at the screen when they hear this, but you know, one of my suggestions is for parents or the adults in the lives of our youth to think about ways that they can create structure over the summer, right? I know our youth, we want you to have some time off. We do want you to lean into that rest and relaxation, but you know, to avoid or kind of stave off some of those things that can come, you know, think about creating structure. And that can be simply by supporting their passions. So if we've got a youth that's into, you know, swimming or drawing or painting, you know, think about a way that, you know, you can get them involved in a class, a program, something that allows them to kind of channel that passion. The other thing that I would say for parents is to encourage their youth to get outdoors. And here's where the parents throw tomatoes at the screen. Parents, we are very good at telling our youth to get off of their devices. We should also get off of our devices, right? And so the best way to kind of engage or encourage youth to spend time outdoors is to do it together. Go as a family, right? Go as a, as a parent-child dyad. Uh, get some fresh air, do some walking, some hiking, some biking, whatever, you know, you, you enjoy when you're outdoors uh, because that fresh air and that movement is good for all of us. Um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, we're talking about kind of mental health summer slide, but there are, you know, realities of the educational summer slide. And so if that is a reality for parents, there are, you know, tons of enrichment programs that are available. Specifically, the Dallas libraries are offering all kinds of free literacy programs to keep that, you know, mind engaged over the summer, again, to kind of maybe stave off some of that, that summer learning loss that we, we hear so much about. So those are the things that I would, you know, have encourage parents to be thinking about the ways in which they can kind of, in a fun way, inject some structure into these, these summer months. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question in the QA. And so I'm going to go ahead and Matthew, since I was going to go to you next, we'll start with you because this is from an anonymous participant who would like all three of you to answer. And it's, if you had a magic wand, this is my favorite question. Oh, solution focused <laughs> brief therapy question. <laughs> if you had a magic wand um, and you could have um, any support that is needed for your program, what would it be? Me first, unlimited funding, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, that, oh, you're really gonna make me answer that first. Let's see, if I had, a magic wand and could any any support for for this program here at ctl is that the question okay i i love my diverse team we have social workers we have marriage and family therapists we have uh counselors and my supervisor and my supervisor's supervisor are both on this call so <laughs> 
hi, here's a headline. But I would love to have um, a medical provider on staff um, because we find that so many of our families are resort resorting to emergency rooms and urgent care for their um, medical care. They do a great job at what they're doing, but there's not a whole lot of prevention going on there. And then when we factor in chronic and severe mental illness, if that's a thing, um, we we just need ongoing um, medical support for our families. And I do have some magic wand. So um, there we <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I would uh, I would love to um, I would love to have that for for the families we serve. Well, when we get off of this call, I'm going to come and use your magic wand <laughs> just for myself. Um, so, Carol, um, I don't know if you want to take this opportunity to talk about um, the health services that we'll be able to offer at the new campus, but would also like to hear from you, the magic wand, um, your answer. Certainly. So we um, in our new campus, we will have two what we're calling mobile health rooms. So, um, and we are um, in um, exploratory conversations right now with medical providers to do immunization screenings, um, different kinds of, of preventive health care, but also chronic disease management um, there, um, and certainly uh, supports for um, signing up for um, health insurance and health-related programs. Um, so, so. That will be there. I don't know that it's going to answer all of uh, that that need, um, but really, you know, there's just there's uh, overcoming that access problem um, is what we're um, aiming to do there. Um, and then I would say, um, definitely, I know that different days I would answer the magic wand question differently. You know, if if housing is more on my mind, um, then I then I might answer, but. Today, as we're talking about um, mental health and emotional well-being, uh, just thinking about um, expanding our mental health programming. Um, there's not enough mental health services in our community, and so expansion of Matthew's team so that we can work with more children, more families, more groups. Um, but also, um, we are um, very interested in a community-wide initiative um, at, in a three-mile radius around um, the, um, our, our new campus and um, a community initiative that identifies um, mental health struggles and gives people, gives volunteers in the community um, tools and skills to respond, but also um, gives more um, education around how to go about improving um, mental health and emotional well-being um, and providing the supports for that. So there's um, some programming that, that we've designed. And so I think this conversation just creates, um, it underscores the urgency of, of, um, of, of that, um, the expansion and then that, that community initiative. So that's how I would use my magic wand today. Great answer. Um, Dr. Rose, I know you said unlimited funding. I think all of us in the nonprofit world would love this, but if there's anything you would add to unlimited funding. <laughs> so all of the things that Carol just said, right? Like the, the, the need far outweighs our ability to respond and respond timely. And so, you know, jokingly, but very serious, like if there was a, a funding arm in heaven that could just open up and rain down, right, where we could eliminate some of the barriers to care, you know, uh, for, for families. But I would say if, if that's too preposterous of a thing for us to consider, <laughs> um, I think a close second for me would be to be able to do away with all the isms. Uh, of the world, you know, if I'm thinking about all of the, you know, structural and systemic inequities and oppression that people uh, experience in this country in particular, um, if I could do away with that, I think I'd really be putting myself out of a job, which is what I'm, I'm working to do daily anyway. 
Um, I think that that is the source of a lot of our societal ills. Um, certainly the a source or a pain point for, you know, uh, mental health challenges. And so if we could tend to you know, racism, sexism, you know, heterosexism, all the things, um, I think we we would be better set up to to be able to have an uh, impact. Those those forces I feel like are strongly working against the things that we all exist on this call to support. I'm so glad you brought that up, Summer. And um, I also know of all of your expertise in that area. And it makes me think of the work that you did in South Dallas, um, where, you know, for our audience, there are adverse childhood experiences um, that get talked about, I think, more often than adverse community experiences, which include things like racial trauma. And ultimately, if we want to um, engage in the most primary prevention, that's the space that we're working in. So thank you, Summer. Um, I'm looking at the time. We had um, an additional question come in, Carol, and I'm going to um, offer this to you. And it's if we need um, legal services support at the new campus. I think I know the answer, but I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would be it would be a fantastic partnership to be able to offer. Um, I mean, we we have we have the physical space, and certainly um, there are many different legal needs that um, participants in our programs have, but also just um, people who are living in that vicinity would have. And so, um, if anybody has that um, interest, then um, I'd love to have the conversation. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left and, and I always wanna end the call. We talked about it some, but for those on the call, because we know, I mean, even for ourselves, we attend webinars and wonder, okay, what's on me to do after this? How can I be a part of healing and conversations, collaboration, et cetera? So I'd love for each of you to answer from a call to action perspective, um, what comes to mind for you and whoever would like to start first. I'll, I'll start. Um, I think that the, you know, one of the things that we've um, uh, really been thinking about um, I think so much more since COVID, I think this is true for society at large um, and, um, but certainly at Center for Transforming Lives. And we didn't even, we didn't, we didn't have a um, clinical counseling department until post COVID when we saw um, the challenges that people were experiencing and that kind of the unmet need. Um, but one of the benefits, I think, of building that programming, there's been so many benefits of building that programming, um, but it has been just greater awareness of, for all of us, how important it is to take care of our own mental health, um, and that it really is the, um, there are professionals, there are, there are people who exist and whose work is really about helping us to navigate through those situations. Um, but there are day-to-day -day steps that I think we all need to be thinking about, particularly as, as providers, um, as people who are seeking to work in this space. We gotta pay attention to our sleep habits, our nutrition, our self-care, our exercise, um, our own inner states and what, how important it is to take care of ourselves um, because whether we're just being there for our families or for, um, for our community, um, if we are depleted, if we are frazzled, if we are all torn up um, because of the pain in the world, um, then, um, then we, have, we have less we have less to offer. So just um, encouraging myself as I, as I say that um, and all of us to, to start there and then work together toward, um, toward well-being for ourselves and our communities. I love that, Carol. That was, that was beautiful and very inspiring. Like, I'm like, what am I going to do for myself today? Um, I, I would say it's something kind of t tangentially related to what, what Carol said, and that is, you know, for uh, someone said, maybe it came out of you, Carol, too, that someone that shared with you, you know, 
where you grow. Where you grow is what you know. Um, and so for those of us who maybe didn't grow up in a household that talked about mental health and wellness, that didn't really understand uh, those, you know, nuances or those challenges um, or, you know, variety of reasons, right, where that wasn't a conversation that was happening. And so now you, you know, find yourself as an adult who encounters people who that is their reality or you're supporting, you know, youth where that is their reality um, to, to take some, some time to educate yourself uh, Specifically here at, at CIS, we offer a youth mental health first aid training. Um, and so for the upcoming school year, I think we have four dates that are posted on our website. And that is a course that, you know, kind of mimics the, the traditional first aid, right? It's the compressions, right? The chest compressions that you're doing for, during first aid until 911 can arrive. This, you know, talks about some of the common signs and symptoms of mental, mental health crises in youth and what to do, kind of that chest compression business uh, until you can get them connected to their next best step, hopefully a mental health service provider of, of some type. Um, you know, but that that's one avenue. There's certainly a number of ways, right, where you can start to to educate yourself, to, to understand the, these realities and this um, lived experience that lots of folks uh, uh, that we come across do experience. And so, um, yeah, just, not letting that be the thing that keeps you from accessing the knowledge, right? Just because that wasn't talked about where you were grown up doesn't mean that as, as an adult now that you can't be empowered to go and, and create an understanding for yourself now. Can I, I know that um, this is kind of out of step, but, but I just, I want to go back to what Dr. Rose is saying, because I did, I mean, I, because my family was, um, did not help have any of those healthy conversations. Mm -hmm. And literally five years ago, I was saying, I do not know what it means to take care of myself. Like I just, mm -hmm. it didn't make any sense to me, um, but I'm, um, but it has, so it, it has been a journey and it has taken really kind of dedicated effort mm -hmm. to figure it out. So just want to underscore that. In, a, in addition to those so vitally important next steps for individuals and for families. I would echo what Carol said and what Dr. Rose said. I wanna offer some, maybe some potential next steps for professionals and for organizations because it's sort of where my team is thinking right now and reminding ourselves and digging in. Um, one, for the sake of efficiency, sometimes we tend to paint with broad brush strokes and we have to continually remind ourselves that we're offering tailored services, individualized services for each person, for each family, because each person's unique. Each family has their own microculture. They're existing in a wider community, absolutely. And we take both those things into account. We're offering tailored services. Um, the other thing that was exciting to hear Carol talk about is the focus not on a top-down mental health system. That happens. We, we have experts. There are crises, but we want um, we want to flatten that system out so that the community is focused on preventative care. And so it makes me think of what's the nursery rhyme about the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker. All of those people are vital parts. And I think of this community in Riverside, those are the folks we want to empower so that we're focusing on um, prevention and um, sustained wellness and not just crisis support. That's important too. Um, and then the other thing, because it's how I spent my morning um, here at CTL, we talk about multidisciplinary teams and we are living and working and doing it every day. And it's so important for us to collaborate our service, collaborate with other service providers, whether that's within organizations or um, or across the aisle and across the street and across uh, the city. So I would say individualized services, preventative care, and um, collaborating with other other folks and continuing ed. Um, CTL does a great job of supporting therapist growth. Um, I've probably, I hope that I at the end of my career, I will have learned more during my career than I did preparing for it. Um, and so we as organizations continue to do the work of learning. Thank you so much, Matthew. 
We are almost out of time. I am going to add to that because I can. Um, that, and I will make this commitment myself as I ask everyone to do the same. Just you in your life, figure out what you can do individually to break down those isms and to speak out into that. That's something that I commit myself to every day of my life. And then Dr. Rose and I have known each other for almost a decade now. Can you believe that? It's crazy. Um, and so the next thing is something that I feel like you have uh, reminded me of, and that's for every single person on this call. We are not meant to do this life alone. We do not need to do this life alone. Ask for help. <laughs> Just let people support you. Um, it is healing and serving in both directions. Um, so we want to thank Everyone for participating. We're going to post um, this video on our YouTube channel and send it out um, to our database. Summer, you're welcome to do the same thing. Um, at CTL, we want to connect with you. We have a variety of volunteer opportunities, and we are on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and perhaps, Carol, one other that I'm forgetting, but please connect with us um, and have a beautiful day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.